Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you all. Nice to be here. We'll give folks a moment to arrive, but just want to say so happy to be here with you all. And for folks for whom it's their first time, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. If you've been here many times, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. What's so interesting and unique about being here is if you're here tonight, you are part of the San Francisco Dharma Collective. It is an entirely volunteer run organization. Come on in, find a chair anywhere. If you'd like a cushion, you can do that. And um, as an entirely volunteer run center, and you know, in the course of what we do here as a drop in night, every single time we gather is slightly different and slightly distinct and so beautiful to weave this together. And I, I know I mention this a lot for folks who come often, but it's really worth repeating, which is each of you being here is a huge generosity. You could absolutely be anywhere doing anything and your presence makes this space more vibrant, more dynamic. And if you believe in, you know, some of the, the long held lineages and teaching, like the more people you're practicing with, kind of the greater the benefit of your practice. So each of us is really contributing to that. So thanks for being here. And we are making our way through this classic text. No problem if it's your first night, but it is, um, yeah, it's such a beautiful text to return to. Um, I have a, a friend here who the first time I taught this text in 2013, yeah, we were um, with a small group, kind of a book study group. So I have many years of notes and post-its. You can tell I went to like too much education from all my flags and post-its and highlighting. Um, and this book, which comes from the 8th century, it's called The Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. It really gives us a detailed account of how to live with an open heart with a world on fire. And that is the world we are living in. And that unfortunately is not new. And luckily there are these kind of trainings and teachings to support us in it. We've made our way through the first chapter. The first chapter is a real inspiration for us. Why? Why should we dedicate ourselves to wake up for the sake of all beings? Isn't it hard enough <laughs> to just try to get through the day? Well, the inspiration really comes from just looking and seeing so clearly that there's no sane alternative to doing that. What are we going to do? Kind of shut out the suffering of the world? Make our safe place away from all the suffering? Has anyone tried that and had it be successful? Like it doesn't work within our own family, within our countries, within this world and our shared environment. So then how do we manage or be with, bear witness and care for the huge amount of suffering, right? Undeniable suffering. And that is the kind of, that is the aspiration of the Bodhisattva is to make every single act of the mind, every single kind of thought, desire, movement, saturated with this aspiration may I wake up for the sake of all beings. And some people may wonder, well, is, is thinking enough? Is an aspiration enough? In order to train to become Simone Biles, right? Um, I heard she just won more gold medals. You have to actually go every day and train and train and train. And when then the opportunity arises to perform, you're ready. So even though what we're doing here is really training the heart and the mind, it's not just to make ourselves feel better or ameliorate some anxiety. It is really in order for us to be able to show up when we are needed, just as we are needed. So that's the, that's the aspiration. I find it just kind of also It's so radical <laughs> to try to move out of self-centeredness, you know, and to really not be orienting towards ourself all the time. And then to do that in community, just even more amazing. I do think gathering in community around shared values, as opposed to creating something or doing something that's material, it really is such a way to feel authentic, 
heartfelt presence in life to feel meaning. One of the other kind of, you could almost say the upsell of the Bodhisattva path, it will make you happy. Happiness, as has been studied for research in the last 50 years of psychology, happiness is a, is a temporary sense feeling, right? Like I have this delici delicious fermented Mexican beverage. It's, it's not a beer for anyone online. It brings me temporary elation and joy, but is not a source of my ongoing well-being. And I know that's kind of silly and obvious, but when we spend so much of our time hopping from one sense pleasure to the next, we miss out on the seeds that we could plant for true sustaining well-being, creating a meaningful life. So part of this pledge, part of this aspiration, part of starting to kind of train and saturate the mind in these compassion practices is so we can be happy because our life is meaningful because we're offering it, not just for us, but for all beings. So that's a little reminder slash recap. In the last four weeks, we've been working on building our way into resting in a more spacious, open awareness. So we've been observing our thoughts and then kind of moving back and observing the one who's observing the thoughts and then finding sometimes these blissful or confusing states where there's this sense of openness, sometimes called emptiness or spaciousness and that is one beautiful way for us to kind of expand the heart and the mind if we can find that space within us there's plenty of room for compassion for everyone right it's no longer feeling this contracted tight state so that's one route and i think we've had some fun right we've been exploring these together it's been it's been pretty cool i've been really impressed your uh, reports at what folks are experiencing and um, delving into the other really beautiful way that we cultivate this kind of bodhisattva uh, intention and aspiration to wake up for the sake of all beings is more directly through compassion, generating compassion. So whereas in awareness, we're kind of removing obstacles so that we can feel how much space there is to care, to hold others. In this case, we kind of, you know, strengthen the heart by directing it towards something that matters to us and then allowing the heart that heartfelt care to just kind of course through the body become the body and also ultimately also become spaciousness so i think i see gladys there behind us. Well, hi it was fun to see you on the bike on the way here i was like yeah <laughs> it was safe we were wearing helmets in the bike lane um, but I love you know, some of your questions and inquiries about the relationship between emptiness and compassion. And what is it like for us to experience that fullness of the heart and also experience a spaciousness in which you don't need to have a target, but there is heart everywhere. So what I would love us to do, we're gonna start with practice tonight. We've been kind of doing some readings and then practicing, but starting with practice tonight, we're gonna experientially walk through going really directly towards the heart, recognizing kind of the preciousness and impermanence and cyclical nature of this human life, allowing the heart to feel tenderized by the suffering of those we love and the world and then allowing the compassion to just continue to flow and flow without any target so we can feel that open, spacious nature of compassion. Sounds good, right? Who doesn't want that? It, it is a little complicated, and so I'd like to kind of talk, walk us through it a little bit so you have some idea of where we're headed. Um, before we do so, Last week in our session, we did the meditation and reflections on the offering practice. So on when we are seeing beauty, can we let that open the heart, like become more aware and mindful of beauty, then appreciate and savor it and then offer it up. And I'm just curious, did anybody continue that practice through the week? It, oh yeah, you guys, double, triple, gold stars. Um, 
but I would just love to hear a little bit of how that was before we go into our next practice. So there's a mic here. So I'll pause. One of the things about having this wonderful collection of every, every single time we are here together, there are new people. And so every time we are here together, we kind of have to reconstellate as a community. And the most simple way I can think of doing that is really asking everyone to adhere to mindful listening and mindful speech. Like the entire time we are here together is practice, not just when we have our eyes closed meditating, but also as we are engaging in community. So when you're speaking, including, you know, how much you say, how often you say, and when you're listening, it's a really wonderful time to work with judgment, right? What arises? What do we think we know? What are our expectations? And be gentle with it. And try to force your way out of judgment. Um, it takes a lot of a lot of practice for us to really meet what is being said with compassion, but notice it and try to generate that here. On board? Okay. Okay, so I'd love to hear from a couple folks. Um, I saw your hand. Would you, are you willing to share? Yeah. Okay. Well, no qualifiers. Um, so I remembered on the walk to work mm -hmm. and just seeing some trees and feeling the wind and just thinking that beauty's everywhere. It's beautiful to be alive. Yeah. And then just kind of offering that up to people. Mm. So. Beautiful. And, and how did it feel to do that? Uplifting. Yeah. Um, kind of exciting. Yeah. Kind of exciting to be like, yeah, we get to be alive. Yeah. Yeah, we, right? Not just like, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, and though you said kind of boring, but it's, it's you know, for better and for worse, like these practices are not always fireworks shifting how the mind orients itself in its habitual way takes like little steps all the time and just that shift away from oh it's a nice day i'm enjoying it which is totally okay but it's very different than this is a nice day wow it's such a wonderful experience to have this nice day may all beings have this nice day it's just a little shift and it could change a lot especially if we practice it a lot Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Yeah. I saw three hands, so here we go. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, um, I went to Tahoe this weekend, and um, so I tried it there, and so obviously kind of, e not, I don't want to say easy, but there's a lot to, yeah. a lot of good nature there. Um, and it was it was really nice. Um, last week when I was doing it, I think I got a little ahead of myself and was trying to offer something up that was a little closer to my heart than just general nature and mm. feel the stuckness in it. And it was like hard, like I could feel the attachment. Mm. And I remember after we like came out of it, I was like, <laughs> I did that right. Like, it didn't feel as easy as everyone else was making yeah. it out to feel. Yeah. Like, it, I felt like almost sad, like, yeah. trying to give something away. So it was mm. nice to go and like drive up there. And like, I, it was a little bit of like an emotional roller coaster just inside of me. And that was like a nice thing that would bring me back to her. Mm. So. Beautiful. And thank you for naming that, you know, it's, it is like kind of training. So we don't start with the hardest things, right? Like may all beings, you know, appreciate and, and have what I have when it's, when it's so close to us, it brings that clinging into, into, into clarity, but it's also, it's, it's helpful to see, yeah. right? And it's, um, yeah, you know, the, the offering practice has these two parts. One is, you know, you're offering it in this symbolic way to all the Buddhas, if that's in your um, cosmology, meaning like I offer you, you know, the, um, the comfort of this cushion. The Buddhas don't need it. So it's just us kind of in a devotional act, lifting up what matters to us, putting our heart, our mind, our body in its appropriate place with like, you know, what's bigger than us. And then for all beings is like adding in that little bodhisattva activity. So not just may I be there for everyone's suffering and along with it, but may I be there with everyone's joy and that rejoicing. So 
yeah, and doing it in the natural world, as I mentioned last week, I do think too that the natural world wants to be appreciated and to help and be held, right? We are, you know, very much intertwined with this living planet and all the beings upon it. And to create that relationality is also helps us get a little out of the transactional, like, where can I take a really cool selfie outside, right? <laughs> and instead, like, really bring it in and feel that connection and rejoicing. So, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I, I, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this and uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question and so I can really, you know, express it and solidify, you know, um, so I've been doing it, um, in the morning, uh, after my meditation, but also finding times when I'm out and about finding things to offer up to, um, from what I read in the book, I've been I've been offering it to the three jewels, basically, mm. right? And 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 um, and I found it does three things. Um, number one, like in the morning, when I'm, it makes it, it puts me in a, a a frame of mind of appreciating what I have to offer, mm. right? The things that I've seen, the things that I've done, the things that are present that I have to offer. That was I, I, it's that's very helpful. Mm. It makes this connection to the three jewels mm. you know it, it make it, it it makes that more present mm. and real as i'm doing it and then when i'm out in the world um i become more present to when i notice something that's there to offer up it, it it's it's very present and it's more enjoyable um like in the, it's like a different dimension of enjoyment yeah like I offered up a Mitchell's ice cream uh, <laughs> chocolate chocolate dipped dolce de leche cone today, oh. and I think the Buddhas loved it. <laughs> I sure did. Thank you. Yeah, and and it is it's good to be a bit lighthearted. You know, again, it's it's so hard for it to not feel. What's the word? too imaginary you know but or and like really if we're able to notice the shift it has in our heart in our mind and how we are appreciating the world we see it's transforming us just because it's simple doesn't mean it isn't helpful right so and it is you know the bodhisattva path is not an easy one and so to give ourselves this refreshment is so important Okay, so if anyone else who wasn't here wants to give that a try, I think you kind of heard from folks what that offering practice is like. <clears throat> and yeah, so this evening, I'm going to walk us through this compassion practice. We have very often here done um, the four remembrances. And um, they can really seem like a downer, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> But they're like very helpful to remind us why we are doing why what we're doing here. Like, why are we not all of us at Mitchell's right now? One, because this is a precious human life that we have. And this opportunity to practice is just so rare. I mean, unbelievable, right? That we get access to teachings, to one another, to a safe place to be and really letting that kind of sense of preciousness. And then the second one, which is, you know, um, the impermanence of all the beings in this world, us included. It's, it's very tenderizing to really let that in. There's no denying of it. And to kind of titrate that just enough, like a little dose of it can become the medicine and not feel overwhelming. So I myself am, um, I'm very allergic to fire ants and bees, as my friend also knows, who saved my life once with that. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that for life forever. <laughs> um, but I, for the last three years, have been getting a little bit of fire ant and bee medicine. So it allows my body to kind of respond to it. And that, you know, letting in that kind of homeopathic dose of the reality of impermanence strengthens the heart. Very helpful. 
So again, not to get into the despair of it, but like, why are we here and not all at Mitchell's, right? Or watching reruns of a show that we love. Um, and then the third, and this one, this kind of remembrance is that everything we are thinking and doing, you know, we are planting seeds of what will happen next. This is the law of karma. Like all the activities we are doing, all the activities we are not doing, all of the kind of thoughts we're energizing, like rumination, right? We are kind of continuing to forge and shift certain ways of being while starving out other ways of being. That remembering and inspiration of what we want to be feeding. And then the, the last, which I, <laughs> I love this coming as the last remembrance, which is just like samsara is unsatisfying, just leaping time and time again towards what feels good and away from what's hard is not satisfying. Do you, did anyone, do we have consensus on that? Yeah, and like really remembering it as an inspiration to dedicate ourselves to transforming the heart and mind. And we do so like we just wanna get rid of all of the obstacles to compassion. Because resting in an open, unconfigured state of compassion is just, it right like it's beautiful that's how we want to be feeling that's how we want to be experiencing the world um, so i'm going to offer these when we start our practice and the way you kind of work with a remembrance or one of these inquiry practices is it's not like uh, take a moment to reflect on the preciousness of human life and you don't need to rehearse an answer per se it's almost like you know dropping the pebble in the pond and noticing what reverberates in the body, in the heart, in the mind. That could be words, could just be sensations. And that's a way in, we're starting to drop into the heart. Most of us are in our heads because that's where we live. So how do we start dropping more into the heart? And then the next part that we'll do is kind of moving towards this sense of and exchange of our care and compassion we start with, you know, compassion for ourselves, the way that we forget those remembrances, this kind of additional secondary suffering by ruminating on things that don't matter, by inadvertently kind of keeping into these habits and patterns that keep us locked up and away from our true nature. We then will kind of work with compassion for our friends, often helping kind of really ignite that light of, of compassion at the heart and care for the world. And then we'll practice compassion without any object. So in that same way with like awareness where we kind of focus and then we rest, we can do that with compassion too, like the flapping of the wings. You know, you have the beautiful, you know, red shouldered hawk flapping its wing and then it glides. And so we're kind of generating like flapping our little wings of the heart with compassion and then we rest in compassion without any target, which also means compassion without any boundary. So when we say like spaciousness of compassion, it's not that it's empty, it's just that there's nothing in the way. So when you are out in the beautiful natural environment, I was just in the mountains uh, for a couple days, like you really get the sense that space fills all, all around it, everything permeates. And we get a sense that our compassion can be like that, not just an active to a target, but a way that we're just resting, like saturated with compassion. So we'll give it a try. Does that sound good? Okay, if folks want to stand for a moment. I know I gave a ridiculously long preamble. Sorry about that. Just give yourself a little stretch. Is there any empty seats? There's cushions. Okay. So since we're going to be doing a practice of compassion, it's really nice to come into the practice uh, 
through being compassionate to our body. So taking a moment and kind of rolling the shoulders and letting our neck kind of move as it wants to move. And feel that sense when we roll the shoulders that we can lengthen the spine and allow the heart to just be slightly more open. And then it can be really nice for us to actually soften the face. So letting our hands be implements of compassion and just gently kind of rubbing around the eye and the cheekbone and the jaw. It doesn't need to be forceful, but just this sense of this kind of gesture of care and invitation to relaxing and releasing all these muscles in the face. No need to express anything, no need to receive anything, just that, that sweet gesture of care, an invitation to the softening. And then gently finding a place where the hands can rest on the lap, maybe on the knees or folded in a way that allows the neck to feel fully at ease, not strained. And feel whatever sense of softening and releasing through the face. Continue to soften and release through the chest, through the belly. Feel an open, warm porousness through the front of the body. Feel or imagine the possibility that we didn't need to have any guard up around the heart just right now. The heart could feel at ease, supported by the belly and the ground beneath us. And feeling and finding the length, the strength, the dignity of the spine. And settling a bit more into the body and allowing our mind to rest by just focusing on the gentle sensations of breath as we lengthen and extend the inhale, maybe counting just to about four, briefly holding at the top and then gently exhaling with the mouth open and loose. Three more times, inhaling slowly, holding, releasing slowly. Twice more, inhaling through the nose. And exhale, releasing through the mouth. One more remedial breath, inhaling through the nostrils. And exhale, relax, release.
And then in order for us to enter these practices of inquiry and compassion, it can be really helpful to feel a sense of our own grounded support. So feel or imagine the presence of compassion, which is always already here. Feeling and imagining that as a sphere of light around the heart area. And remembering that the many times the heart has been broken or open, there continues to be an opportunity for more kindness and more care. Feeling the strength of this heart. Feeling and imagining that strength as this area of light. And also sensing and remembering all the love that has been received in this heart. All the care and kindness, which literally has built who we are from the inside out. Feel and imagine this quality of the heart and body of compassion. If you get distracted or carried away, no problem. Just coming back for a couple more moments. Really priming the pump of compassion here. By feeling and imagining the presence of compassion we have extended in the past. The presence of compassion within us, which has been received. And maybe a sense of this ongoing flow of compassion that's always moving through us. And to invite us to drop more deeply into this heart center, to remind us of our motivation for practice, dedication. <clears throat> we consider these inquiry phrases. Reflecting upon the preciousness of this human life so difficult to gain and so easy to lose. Once more, again, focusing on the body without needing an answer or idea, just what does it feel like to reflect on the preciousness of this human life? So difficult to gain, so easy to lose. And reflecting upon the impermanence of all beings. 
ourselves and everyone we know may get sick, may get old, and will certainly die. Really working with the, the energy that arises from this reflection. Noticing if we start to slump into despair or overwhelm and inviting ourselves to lean back into compassion. And use a little of this clear seeing as this medicine by reflecting on the impermanence of all beings. That everyone we know, including ourselves, may get sick, may get old, and will certainly die. And the third remembrance, which is reflecting that every action Everything we do in body, speech, and mind has a consequence and impact. Again, just this simple, clear seeing Reflecting that every single thing we are doing, seeing, feeling, and thinking has an impact. If at any time the remembrances feel just heavy or they're getting stuck in rumination, you can always come back to the breath, placing a hand on the belly or the heart. And then the fourth remembrance. Chasing after what feels good and trying to hold on running away from what feels bad and trying to avoid will lead to ongoing suffering. I'm trying to hold this without any sense of self-recrimination or blame, just this clear seeing as motivation Reflecting and seeing that when we cling and hold on to what feels good, try to avoid, run away from what feels bad, it does not lead to sustainable happiness. In fact, quite its opposite. And really noticing the shifts and changes in the body. What are the qualities of sensation and where? Returning to that sense of warmth and love at the heart. And beginning with a sense of compassion for ourselves for the ways we get caught up and we forget. We don't remember the preciousness of this human life. We don't remember that everything's changing. and Loss is inevitable. Compassion for ourselves when we perpetuate the habits that create misery. Holding ourselves so tenderly here. May I be more free 
from these habits? May I see more clearly? May I remove any and all obstacles to compassion for myself, which of course will ultimately allow me to be compassionate to all beings. Breathing in, really inviting that sense of such unconditional care for ourselves. Breathing out, extending that sense of care to permeate the body, the heart, the mind. Breathing in the light of compassion, breathing out, becoming the light of compassion. And then extending our sphere of concern to those who we cherish and love, those close to us in our life who we so deeply want to be free. Considering the same aspiration that they also could remember. They could see more clearly the ways they get caught up and stuck in habits that create suffering for themselves and others. Maybe bringing one or two people to mind where this suffering is so clear. This feeling of stuckness, unable to move or change. It can be like a closed loop, feel like a prison of the mind or heart. Feel that tender inclination of compassion towards these beloved beings. And again, with the breath, inviting in this aspiration, this quivering of the heart with compassion. May these beloved beings be more free. May these beloved beings release the delusions and embrace this pure light of compassion. A couple more breaths, really allowing the body, heart, and mind to feel the goodness of this aspiration. The yearning for others to be more free, more fully who they are, awakening to their own heart. And then tenderly and gently opening the heart even more. Extending and expanding our sense of care and concern to the greater world. Maybe there's a group or groups of people for whom the suffering is so real, so blatant. Whether stuck in ruminative, painful mental states or living in conditions of violence and fear. Again, noticing that quivering of the heart, that aspiration that these beings could be more free, more safe, more loved. Feeling the strength and the dignity of the spine, the strength and the dignity of our compassion to hold its own. And then allowing the heart to radiate. 
May these beings know peace and ease. May these beings be free from inner and outer harms. Feel and notice the body. Find and connect to the presence of compassion, which is always already here. And then releasing any target or being who we are directing our compassion towards. Feeling this body, heart, and mind as a body, heart, and mind of compassion. And resting in the awareness that is saturated with compassion. Feeling the presence of loving awareness within us and all around us. And allowing ourselves to lean back into that loving awareness. Whatever thoughts or memories or images arise, let them arise within the loving space of presence and awareness. Softening and brightening, and softening and brightening. Softening the heart and brightening the awareness of the heart. A couple more moments here, feeling both the presence of compassion within the body, as well as the presence of compassion not held only within the body. When the bell rings, don't go anywhere. Keep practicing. Keep feeling this presence of loving awareness within the body and all around.
Thank you for your practice. So it would be lovely to uh, hear if um, anyone has any reflections or questions on that practice. Anything you'd like to clarify or anything you'd like to share, especially related to the practice. Friends online, you are welcome to share and or ask questions. But it's hard, my eyes are getting worse. So maybe like wave or send one of those cool new emojis. Anybody in this? Oh, Claudia. Uh, are you able to unmute Claudia? Oh, one moment. Practice your compassion. There we go. Hello, how is Mexico? <laughs> Great. Good. Um, I noticed as we were targeting some people with our compassion that um, it was hard for me to feel compassion towards a certain person and I uh, I was kind of like trying to justify in my mind why, you know, because I felt like I had resentment and why, because, you know, I've been hurt and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, and then I was beginning to recriminate mm. myself for feeling that way. Yeah. And it, it was so opportune for you to to talk about having self-compassion it was good though to be aware mm. and reminisce I mean really it made me think about my my thoughts my words and my actions unkind really yeah uncompassionate um and and I understand why I I don't necessarily want to justify it, even though even though I tend to go there, <laughs> you know. But uh, so I don't know. I mean, do you have any yeah. any comments or? If, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's yeah, a family, well, it's a family member, and it, it kind of triggers. Yes, you know. Yeah, Claudia, you always go for the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> you, and I appreciate it. You're a compassion warrior. And it's, it is, I think, really interesting to notice, you know, even as we are directing compassion, that there's still another part of our mind that's like, but they don't deserve it. And like, <laughs> I'm still mad, right? And often it's, it's actually strangely a little bit, and it hurts. And, and hurt, right. Yeah. So I think, you know, the hurt part is what needs our compassion. Mm right before we can then extend it and like wrap someone else in in it right and that's so you can even in that moment you can oscillate between instead of the kind of the narrative the self-righteous blame narrative which i love totally down i feel you it's very convincing at times oscillating between the the desire to feel compassion for this person who's obviously suffering and one of it's a family member who's difficult like we really know they're suffering like we mm. know it mm. and we know that we're hurt and so we can go between extending theirs and also like this is so hard for me and not to make it about you but to resource yourself to be there for other that's the entire bodhisattva path mm. and so being able to do that with our family highest level right <laughs> start smaller <laughs> with like someone who cut you off you know <laughs> but um you know but at least we know the territory like that's the territory like how can we 
again, remove those obstacles so that we can really be that light in the world we want to be, that compassion we want to be. So thank you for your honesty and warriorship. And let me know how that goes of like that oscillation between. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else, especially interested in the kind of unconfigured, non-conceptual resting in compassion? Did that, anybody experience that? Yes, I see Gladys, I see Jimmy and Cage. Can somebody pass it back there? Okay, thanks Cage. Um, I have a question, probably need some clarification. And I experienced this in recent compassion practice and other awareness practice. Mm -hmm. So when you cued resting in compassion, and then I almost feel like some unresolved emotion come up. Like mm. for example, during this today, like a friend had her loss and I also felt the grief for her, but it was, I probably didn't have enough time to kind of like fully be with her during yes. the day. And when you say rest in compassion, I'm like, whoa, like that, the grief that I felt for her and the compassion is like this very spacious backdrop holding me, which is huh. not like flowing, but it's like very strong, sturdy. And it almost feels like I'm doing the handshake or whatever. Yes. To feel fully the emotion. Yes. So I'm just curious, is that another thing? So um, just so I understand when, so previously it was thinking of this friend, you know, and earlier in the practice and their loss and that residue emotionally was present. Mm -hmm. And so then when opening into a more spacious awareness, did it feel like there was something solid still in which was being held by the, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, beautifully described, so glad to talk about the handshake practice, which is a practice we uh, often do here. It's actually been a while, so I'll bring it back, um, popular demand, um, in which we really just meet the somatic sensation of the emotion without any agenda, without any expectation, a practice by Sokni Rinpoche to really help us drop into more spacious awareness without getting caught up in the story of what we're feeling and why. But it's such a beautiful kind of orientation towards, you know, there's uh, the terms we use in like mm, research psychology is like emotion regulation, which I think is far overstated. We, it's not all that, I, like sounds like we can actually do a lot, <laughs> you know, like people always ask me, you do have a, a lecture on like managing or regulating emotions. And I'm like, we can feel them <laughs> and we can like hope that they self liberate. Um, and sometimes that happens. But I think this idea of like meeting it and then meeting it with compassion, right, in a dis direct way. So that's, you know, there's there is often described as these like relative and ultimate forms of compassion and worth describing that the relative is kind of a reaction. This hurts. I have compassion. And that's beautiful. We could do that all day long. We need to do that all day long for ourselves and others. And then the ultimate, which you can rest in, there's no target. There's no target seems like the wrong word. There's no directionality. It just is like permeating like sunlight is permeating. Sun's not like, ooh, I'm gonna give you a sunburn, right? It's like all, everything, it's the same sun. So there's no, you know, almost no spotlight. And I'm just curious, like, what did it feel like to have both the kind of density of the emotion that was here and some of the space, like? I think the holding felt very sturdy. It's like, whoa, like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the emotion also, it's it's not easy, I think, to experience fully, but yeah, it it it, it it's whatever that's necessary, and it's good. It's not hard. Yeah, yeah, you're not resisting it. So beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and then Cage. Yeah. Let's see, um, I really, you know, I feel like a lot of the times there's and I have done it a lot with you and others, the rest and awareness and spacious awareness, and it's, it's bright and spacious <laughs> and feels wonderful. And I don't often hear the instruction to rest in compassion. And so I don't know if I've 
done that very much, but it felt different. Mm. And um, I guess I kind of expected it to feel the same. So I was curious with the rest and compassion. I think there was more emotion there where I could feel a sense of sadness and like mm. almost made me cry. Mm. Um, and like it was very tender and more in my heart instead of just like the bright airiness of my mind. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, I think you said somatic and it did feel maybe more somatic than just mm. being in space, what I imagined to be spacious awareness. Yes. Um, and so I, I guess I'm always curious about the difference between the two. And yeah. I mean, I know it's not, they're one, they're not two, and they're one in the same, but yet there's still just like a little bit of, it felt different. And it, it felt really warm. I could feel the warmth mm. and that you've spoken of came through more yes. with resting, just phrasing it, resting in compassion rather than uh, a spacious awareness. So that was also like, something curious that I yeah like oh this is a little different but beautifully described and um just because I, I i think it's important how we speak about our experience you say you said um how i imagine awareness to be how you experience awareness to be right because when you are you know as you do like dedicating yourself to these practices it's not imaginary and right it, it's real like these are states of consciousness that we experience and they're just as real as watching television right yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. so um just to to say that and then you know i just think it's really interesting to hear from gladys and you that you know we like my my hope for us was to actually kind of go through the heart and open and that then the heart is still like present meaning the kind of in some ways, the weight of the heart, it can be grounding, it can be embodying. And so spacious awareness doesn't need to feel light and bright and completely free from any worry or concern in the world. Spacious awareness, you know, is warm and is compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think in this practice, because we did the kind of, we did do that more deeper dive into the heart, it makes sense that that was still showing up and it wasn't the only thing within spacious awareness. I will say, and I, I know this is a lot of like concept terms, but I think it's worthwhile. When you hear teachers like Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche uh, talk about, you know, the body, speech, and mind, mind is spacious warmth. So it's not just like an empty, open, luminous place. It is the warmth. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's really worth exploring these subtle gradations of how bringing awareness, having compassion. And my guess is similar with Gladys, if you rested there long enough, like if this class went till nine o'clock, that there would still be the heart, mm -hmm. you know, but there would be more and more of the bright too, like they can and do exist together. Great question. Thanks. Right. Jimmy. Um, conceptually, the idea of um, offering compassion in an open way without an object to which the compassion is being offered, that's something that, you know, I mean, I'm familiar with that. In our, there was a, uh, a group of us who were in, in touch with one another about our meditation and one of the, the questions about the offering practice when it came up, what am I offering to? And, it, and I immediately, this is, this is something that I've been working with for a long time, is Buddha Dharma Sangha. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's the three jewels that I'm offering to. But then I'm thinking, well, also I'm, Nothing in particular. I'm not offering, it's not so much that I'm offering to anything. It's more like I'm offering. Yes. And so it's the same thing with compassion. Yes. In that when I'm offering compassion to various people in my life or groups, there's a, there's a, a lot of story going on. Mm. 
in that offering. And the offering can be genuine and and authentic, but there's there's a lot of story about it. You know, do they deserve it? Do I am I a good person for doing it? Am I not? Am I holding back? Is it tough? Is it is it easy? Is it you know? There's all that, but when you brought us through this meditation and had us offering compassion just in an open way, that story falls away. Mm. And it, get, it, fe it felt, yeah, there was, it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was in here, in my head, in my, in my perceptual yeah. kind of awareness. It went, Mm. And it felt like it was in my chest and my gut. And it was just offering compassion. But, you know, it was just offering compassion. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. And it reminds me of um, one thing I wanted to say tonight, which is there are these different ways for us to really feel compassion and learn about compassion. And some of that is just a spontaneous arising of compassion we can feel when we meet suffering. Some of it is us generating compassion, right? Like to specific people. And then also we can be in the presence of someone who is radiating unconditional compassion. Some of us were lucky enough to have that when we were children, not all of us you know, and maybe just for a time, right? But that, you know, um, I really hold this to be so true. And um, Alan Wallace, who's, you know, really my root teacher and spent many years with these accomplished Tibetan masters as a translator. And he says, you know, what really adheres him to compassion practice is having been held in unconditioned compassion so often by practitioners for whom that is how they're living. So most of us here might not encounter that, but we do encounter people who are just radiating kindness to us for no reason. It, it happens, right? And to feel the recipient of that is also a huge inspiration for our practice and something we can kind of, what does that feel like when, when we receive it? What might that be like to then just offer it without any point, without any purpose. Yes. Question, comment? Please, can somebody think? I just have a quick question, very silly. Um, <laughs> could, uh, could I you... like silly questions. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it's very silly. Um, could you clarify the difference between uh, compassion and empathy? Yes. That's not silly, but it's a good one. Um, and this is, and I will say, I'm going to tell you my point of view. I'm a contemplative social scientist, so I'm drawing from neuroscience, psychology, also from the traditions. But I think I really appreciate the precisioning that I've heard of in the contemplative science field, where with empathy, it's this combination of our immediate emotional resonance to suffering and then our appraisal like our, so that immediate resonance is an embodied, almost immediate. And then the appraisal, which is a cognitive process of how we then perceive what's happening. So our empathy is not always compassionate. We can use empathy to be quite manipulative. Like I recognize this suffering. How can I take advantage of this situation? And compassion is the heartfelt aspiration to alleviate suffering when we meet suffering. And so, Ideally, we have empathy-informed compassion. So we see clearly the suffering, and then our heart moves to that response of compassion. But empathy can also lead to feelings of like aversion, like I don't want that, or you know, blame. It can lead to despair and overwhelm, which is not compassion. Um, I've got a paper about it online, if you'd like to check it out. If you just look up my name, it's like there's a research paper on empathy, it's freely available if you want diagrams. <laughs> I love diagrams. Okay, okay great. Thank thanks. you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, I'm gonna, oh yeah, you even have some time for the text. Um, but truly, your questions and your um, 
reflections are super valuable. So if you have one that hasn't gotten answered yet, also happy to respond to that. Okay, silly or otherwise. Um, so last week I was saying that this chapter is pretty funny. I, I, it's, a, it's a strange set of verses. And the way that this book is organized is it's this eighth century teachings and then commentary by Pema Chodron, which is really beautiful. And um, the first part of the chapter is this offering. So you've heard some people talk about, you know, how to build in this practice of offering to tenderize the heart. And then um, the second part of the chapter is confession, which is such a loaded word. <laughs> um, I am not from a tradition where there's confession, but um, I've seen the movies. So I know what happens there it can be kind of heavy duty. And uh, yeah, I think the idea of confession here, right? So offering is a way of tenderizing the heart and moving out of self-centeredness when we encounter pleasure in something that feels good. And this confession, um, specifically, you know, the way that uh, Pema Chodron's teacher, Chogyam Trimpa, called it, it would be these um, confessing your neurotic crimes. Um, your neurotic thought crimes. Everyone laughs because they know. <laughs> like when you ruminate on that same thing and you're like, I'm going to do something else. And then you're ruminating about it again, right? Like that, that like persistent ruminative way. And the goal or aspiration of this confession, and this is supposed to be in front of other people. Spoiler alert, we're not doing that um, tonight as a collective. <laughs> We're just going to talk about it as a practice. Um, but I think it's, you know, this idea that sharing it with others, and there's a term that's so beautiful, the Kalyana Mitra, spiritual friends. This is why we need to practice together, because we actually really need people that we can confess our neurotic thought crimes to one another. <laughs> and they can be like, I see you, I love you, I get you, cut that shit out, right? So just an invitation and description of that practice. And when we did Old Path White Clouds, which is this uh, biography of the Buddha written by Thich Nhat Hanh, there is a couple times when it's like interesting because in this historical life of the Buddha, you recognize how much drama there was in the Buddha Sangha, which makes me feel relieved. <laughs> Every Sangha has got drama. Um, and in this case, you know, this, um, this process of confession allows the Sangha to come back together, the community of practitioners to come back together. So and you have to really be honest about what's going on for you. Um, and then, sorry, I want to say one other thing um, to your, your comment, Jimmy, and to like this idea of radiating compassion as awareness. Whenever you read the historical descriptions of the Buddha, I have a sense that when you encountered him as a being, you're just like blasted with that radiant sense of love. Like people are just like disarmed, you know, like serial killers throw down their weapons, like no joke, right? Angulimila, like just that goodness is so palpable. The compassion for everyone, irrespective of anything. And I have had the good fortune to be um, in the presence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and it really at least in my experience and the folks I was around, it is like that like blast of like warmth and compassion and goodness and kind of reconfigures your um, understanding of what it means to feel loved. Like it wasn't like he loves me, Eve, like no, he just loves. And it is still like completely, I don't have to be anybody special, like my identity doesn't matter, which is very, uh, amazing to have that gift. Um, but back to confession, more importantly. Um, so I want to read a little bit about this. Uh, so Pema says, you may ask, isn't it enough to acknowledge my regrets to myself? And this does help, but it doesn't dissolve self-deception. When we express our regrets to the Buddhas or another human being, we can't kid ourselves. As an act of self-compassion and self-respect, we use a witness to expose ourselves to ourselves. Thus, instead of carrying around the burden of shame, we're free to make a fresh start. The benefit of laying aside our neurotic crimes is being able to go forward without guilt. 
The practice of confession is an excellent way to move beyond guilt and self-deception. And it relies on the view that neurosis, while it may feel monolithic or immutable, is essentially transitory and insubstantial. Uh, confessing, like making an offering and prostrations, helps us let go of this fixed version of who we are. I mean, we're so stingy with our things we think are bad about ourselves. Like we never share them, right? And this idea almost like you make an offering of these ways you think you're, you're not good. You're thinking in these harmful ways. You're acting in these harmful ways. And I mean, especially the neurotic crimes, like we don't want to tell even our closest friends about the stuff we're ruminating about. We hold it so close. And in that way, like we may hold it close, we may apply some compassion to it, but what Pema is saying and what Shantideva is saying is like, lay it all out. There's a, so, a form of self-centered attachment by keeping your neurotic crimes to yourself. Like share it, offer it, and allow it to be, you know, this word, um, she calls it, or sorry, uh, Zigar Kontrol Rinpoche calls it positive, oops, positive sadness. But actually, I think it is like healthy remorse is another way I've heard that described. So how do we actually have a sense of being able to recognize the harm we've done and then being able to feel like that's not me. That's not who I am. Otherwise, there's like, it's interesting, the self-centeredness, not with grandiosity, not with like how great we are, but the self-centeredness of how bad we are. Like shame is that. Shame is defined as like this fixed idea that I am bad instead of I've done these bad things. And so supposedly these confessions, and as we, as those of us who've been following along know, Shantideva likes to go big. So let me read his, uh, his proclamations. Um, in this and all my other lifetimes, wandering in the round w without beginning, blindly have I brought forth wickedness, inciting others to commit the same. I have taken pleasure in such evil, tricked and overmastered by my ignorance. Now I see the blame of it, and in my heart, oh, great protectors, I declare it. And I love this part especially, blindly have I brought forth wickedness. So not like, I'm really bad, so I do bad things, but because I don't see clearly, I'm perpetuating harm. So again, without expectation of you confessing your neurotic thought crimes, does that resonate for anyone? Like we're creating and like re-energizing these habits that are not only not good for us, not good for others. Like number one example of this is gossiping and shit talking, right? Yes, it creates bonds, <laughs> but like it's not, it's not good, right? It's not like genuinely wholesome and there's it's so funny i love when like buddhists get together and they're like i want to practice right speech but i'm gonna lampoon this person right and it's just you know being able to own that and say it like i engage in in shit talk occasionally and i do it because of you know like like why even it's like here he says because i take pleasure in such evil that sounds heavy duty the reality is, who here sometimes enjoys shit talking? Because it feels good. The rest of you need to get better on your confession. <laughs> right? There's like, a, it's so compelling. And I'm not saying like, stop all the things and do nothing. But just like, be clear. And, and I have, I actually had a friend the other day. We were chatting about a mutual colleague, it's a contemplative science world. And um, he engaged in some shit talking, it's true. And he texted later and he says, I got away with myself. And I, I would never want that to get back to that person who we both know, because I really care about them. And I was like, wow, you can just do that, you know, instead of trying to like, I'm not going to say anything bad ever. And if I do, I'm bad, you know, just the, the confession, but without it, I mean, I don't, I don't know a lot about confession. Again, it hasn't been my cultural tradition, but I don't know if it always is really authentic. You're confessing these things, but okay. <laughs> Not... <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and or you might like make up things. Is that true? I've heard. 
Yeah. I've learned to instead of shit talking at people back, I just talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So at least you know you're there. Yeah. Yeah. That is that is one way. <laughs> Being direct and clear. And like, you know, making this I, I I don't I think there's a better word than confession. I do think this more like um sharing. And I like the way Pema describes it too, because she's saying um we use a witness to expose ourself to ourself. We're not asking to be redeemed. Like, I'm going to confess this thing. Will you tell me I'm good? No, we're confessing it for the sake of like, it needs to be heard by me. But if I just say it, I might kind of hold back a little or hedge or make these, you know, compromises. <clears throat> so she describes that, um, this is the traditional Tibetan practice of the four powers of confession. And so this is a way to, again, kind of come forth in a community. One is recognition of the misdeeds with positive sadness, reliance on basic wisdom, remedial action, and the resolve to do our best and not keep making the same mistakes. So I think all of these are pretty clear, like recognition, you actually have to be mindful of what we've done that might be harmful. And that part of confession, you know, this is a less fun homework assignment for the week than, you know, uh, offering all the beauty to the world. But it is and can be useful at the end of the day to really be honest, like, when did I fall out of, like, the true nature of who I am, you know, my best self? When did I, like, in my haste, cause harm or just avoid? or like perpetuate something that wasn't good. So that's, that's the recognition. Oh, yeah. This also applies to just like self negative thoughts. That's right. Not right. Actual... Yep. Towards oneself. Yeah, towards oneself. Absolutely. And towards others. No, thank you. That's a beautiful, you know, cause that one, that one's real hard. Right? I know, like there is that classic saying, like if anybody treated me the way I treat myself, right? We'd, we'd get a restraining order. Like, you can't say that to me. And yet, yeah, no, beautiful. And then the reliance on basic wisdom, this, you know, this might be a little bit less clear to folks. Um, it's this idea that, and this is how it balances the potential to succumb to shame or feeling of badness. Like this idea that we are basically good. Whether we are criticizing ourselves or shit talking our colleagues, that's not all of who we are. So first we recognize, then we kind of rely on the basic goodness. Then this remedial action, like, is there anything we can do to, to do it better? Right? So my colleague texting me, like I got away with myself. Please don't share this. And then the resolve. This one can get really tricky if you're doing it all the time. You're just like, again, I resolve to not do this. But like you keep doing it. Like you keep doing it step by step, day by day, breath by breath. It's hard to break these habits. I've been working for like three years on like how to be less like feelings of anger and irritation in my everyday life. And like that resolve has to start like every day over and over and over and I fall off the wagon every day right and then you just kind of like come back like this aspiration is clear i care like what can i do and for me i notice <clears throat> i feel more irrit irritated um when i'm in a rush so that's a remedial action maybe i shouldn't pack my schedule so much and there's less opportunity for that tightness to arise in which irritation is likely to come so that's the thing. Did I see a question? Yeah. Do you mind saying it there? Thank you. So for folks who don't know, that mic is so friends online can hear. Yeah. Um, when we first started talking about the book and like the neurotic crimes, mm. um, it was helpful when you shifted to like the shit talking thing. Cause yeah. It makes it easy, but it seemed like um, rumination was a crime also. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you could like maybe, because it, it makes sense to me like why, you know, speaking poorly about someone yeah. would be, cause harm, but maybe if you could like 
expand on how rumination yes. causes harm? Yeah. Anybody have a, a hot topic of rumination these days? Yeah, just call it out, please. Or no, maybe in front. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just made me think. I have a teenage daughter, and yes. they were talking. Just I read some article just about how girls who ruminate, like how that ends up in terms of self-esteem later yeah. down the road. So that's like that continual harm over and over and over. Right. And how that manifests. As right. Adults. Right, and so the rumination might be on like body image or like status. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and I. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I think rumination and stress, you know, are like so linked, right? It's. You know, it's really, um, we think about having a difficult emotional experience where we feel, especially I'm, I'm going to channel my inner teenage girl. Um, she's always here. Um, of feeling like disrespected or left out. That happens and the pain of it physiologically felt. Every time I ruminate about it, it's physiologically felt again. And there's this desire to maybe like protect ourselves in the future from it happening. So we're like, I'll just keep thinking about it and other contingencies, but we're energizing this kind of neurotic rumination. Um, yeah, and I, so it's a, it's a good question and clarification. It's not that we will ever be able to avoid the pain of being disrespected or unseen, but we can choose to not kind of keep going with it. And we have to be able to see it, right? So that's why it's so important, just like recognition. Misdeed, again, it sounds so like scolding, like, oh, you've been ruminating, you know, but more just that mindfulness of I'm creating a misery in my mind by doing this. Yeah. Yes. And one quick riff on that as well, as a committed ruminator. <laughs> uh, one thing I noticed in myself, which I've been working on um, every day, has to always come back is that another way that it causes harm when I ruminate is that I think every cycle of rumination is kind of like, you know how like a, um, a snail is putting down layers of their shell. Mm. And every single time I ruminate, it's another cycle of putting down and crystallizing and ossifying whatever is currently in my head about the person or the thing I'm ruminating about. So one cycle of rumination, maybe I can break through when I finally yes. have that conversation with them. But if I ruminate 20 times, by the time I'm with the person I need to have a discussion with, for example, I've got such a crystallized, yes. stony caricature of them yeah. that I have created layer by layer. And I'm so keenly aware that every rumination is just adding another yeah. thin layer of that. Beautiful. And you know what you can do is you can do positive rumination like with compassion, you know, so like hitting it the other way, like, God, may I just be more and more loving, may, how much more loving can, I, I don't know, it's just like kind of a joke, but like, you know, these habits of mind work both ways. Yeah, yeah, and to be able to see that we, you know, we solidify on an idea or like one thing that happened, and then we can create so much more suffering. So it is really practical. Um, so again, your homework, Recognizing your misdeed with positive sadness. Reliance on basic goodness. Remembering your basic goodness. It's not make you bad. Remedial action. What can be done? Right? And then, and again, if that's towards oneself, can we then, you know, just add that compassion? Like, I'm sorry for that way I was treating myself today or that way I was putting myself down again. And the resolve. And have fun with the resolve. Because it's hard, you know, to, it's like a commitment, a recommitment. And it's like, I'm going to be so much less of an asshole tomorrow, right? <laughs> like, whatever is like, okay, fine, you know, just trying um, can feel really good. Okay, so let's really like come back to the very beginning here with this outrageous vow of the Bodhisattva. 
which I hate to tell you, if you're in this room, you probably already made in other lifetimes. So get on board. <laughs> and this is this commitment to train and to improve our ability to see clearly with compassion, ourself and other beings. And so if it feels natural and comfortable, putting hands together at the heart and reflecting on these simple phrases, for as long as space remains, so too shall I remain and relieve the suffering of the world so that all beings could experience freedom and ease. May I be an island for those needing landfall, a lamp for those needing light. For those who are suffering and ill, may I be both medicine and doctor. For all beings, for all time, we dedicate this practice, our energy and time, that each and every being could be free. So wonderful to be here with you all. Always a highlight of my week and just really love getting into the nitty gritty and love your reflections and love your, um, your thoughts. Um, we do this every Wednesday. Next week I'm teaching at Esalen, woohoo! So Nicole Chase will be here. Some of you were here when she was here before. She's an amazing teacher. She's gonna be picking up on the thread and doing another compassion practice next week. And then I will be back. We'll do some more confession. And um, <laughs> I've, I've shared this before. I'm in the, uh, the dream phase process of creating a, a closed group uh, for practitioners. Um, I didn't put a piece of paper out, but maybe I can put one out. Oh, thanks, Mace. Um, we're probably going to do a small group of 16 starting in November. If you put your name there, you'll get an email in the next week or two trying to find the right space and the right time to practice together for a year.